at, he in, interviewed at that time over a 20 year period 500 of the most wealthy uh, individuals in the, in the world. It's interesting to note, one, there were no women in that group. Burl. Uh, yeah, I know, but Burl wasn't there then. And uh, number two, he only found three that almost had peace of mind. Almost had a balanced life, if you will, using, using 90s uh, language. And I, but I, excuse me, by that I meant that when you have that kind of wealth, there is no peace of mind. When you've generated, because all those 500 guys generated the money themselves, that was the first generation money. Anybody that's got any peace of mind is the second, third, and fourth generation if they don't put it down with a tidy bull man. There is no peace of mind. You're running and gunning. I have peace of mind now more because I've, you know, I, I still have things to prove to myself. I certainly don't have anything to prove to anybody else. And that's an important concept and it's even more important why you asked that, the good that you asked that question. Because you ought to be there to prove it to yourself, not anybody else. And as I said during the break, um, disassociating yourselves with people that aren't as successful as where you want to be means family a lot of times. That's not easy to do. You know, a daughter is a daughter the rest of her life and a, a son's a son till he takes a wife and all that baloney. It's not easy to do. It was easy for me to do. For 10 years I didn't allow my children to, to basically to see my relatives or anybody. Because I wanted them to get through the age of reason and then they had my value system in there. And now my, my, my kids look at our relatives Doofuses. <laughs> La familia. How do you say doofus in Spanish? Anyway? Pen <laughs> yeah. Pendejo, yeah. <laughs> the uh, and and in my in, in my kid, in fact, I've said this before, it's slightly tongue in cheek, but I put my oldest son and my former twenty three year old administrative assistant, Auntie Perkoff, against anybody in this room in a negotiation. Andy Perkoff, who met me at the Abraham Seminar. How many of you saw me at Abraham Seminar? Okay. He came up to me. Now, it's interesting. He wrote Jay a letter asking, Jay, can you introduce me to a top-notch entrepreneur that I'll work for free to learn from him? Jay never answered the letter, my, my dad. At the, at the seminar, and you've heard me say that I already had a goal to get up and talk, and I knew I was going to talk, and I knew I was... Okay. This kid comes up to me, he's hanging on me like my shadow, he's following me around and he said, Mr. Pena, you know, I live near you in PV and I'll come and work for you for a year for free just to learn from you. And I said, no, no, and then I thought about it, I said, okay, let's have dinner. We had dinner two or three times and then, the, now this is a kid that was smart, he made $80,000 in his high school senior year in his business. Now this kid was a comer before I met him. Now, now he's, now he's an assassin. <laughs> He worked with me 11 months in one week. I mean, this kid could rip the heart out of anybody in this room. Anybody. I mean, this kid, I've seen him take on 55-year-old CEO of a Fortune 500 company and eat him for lunch. The kid was right. The guy was wrong. Auntie knew it, and Auntie wouldn't relent until he just beat the guy down like a hammer. Until he says, okay, I fucked up. Uh, I screwed up, kid. Excuse me. But, I mean, he lived with me practically day and night for 11 months. I mean, and now he's gone out and started his own consulting company. He's still going to school. He hasn't graduated from undergraduate school yet. And he's not going to a proper school. I mean, proper in the sense of, you know, Wall Street proper. He's going to Pepperdine, which is a good school. But, I mean, he's not going to, a, you know, one of the, the big schools. But the kid is just, he's an assassin. I mean, he's, he's, he's unbelievable. By the time he's 30 years old, I mean... I don't know, you know, but because he hung around me and that's what the mentor system's all about. Now he even took it one step, he stopped doing, he stopped his mortgage business, which he had, and he just lived with me and he traveled and we went all over the place and he sat through meetings and what'd you think of this? What was this? What did the guy say? And, and we go back and forth, no, you didn't notice this, you didn't notice, and, and, and then now, but that's what it's all about now. I mean, he, you know, not many, I've had other people that have offered to work for me for nothing. And, uh, 
but the point is you got to be there with somebody that's been there and done that so important been there and done that not been there and read about it okay my management style and the management style of all these people I've alluded to is not theory X theory Y theory Z which is the new uh, uh, rah-rah and whatever theory they've come up after that XY is one is you know you treat your employees soft lights music and you be nice to them the other one is to beat the crap out of them you know like the slave traders and you know that's simplistically what theory X and theory Y is but to be successful you have to have some combination because you gotta have a carrot and a big stick basically and learn through experience and you and just like discipline employees you don't learn to do it unless you do it you sure as heck don't learn it from reading a book I don't care if you read 7,000 books you're not gonna learn to discipline employees and all employees need discipline from time to time from a book as I said earlier structure follow strategy the strategy you come up is how you build your company what kind of people you need are you marketing are you financial services are you this are you that then you come up with a kind of individual if you're gonna go from growing internally to growing externally you probably have to switch people or at least key people because it's not many people in, that are good enough experienced enough that have done both now there are people in industry with fortune 50 companies fortune 100 companies that have that's why the overhead is so large on those companies because they've got people that, for every situation possible and the older the company the more people they've got the more ad hoc committees they've got the more experience they've got but it, it costs it's been it's my experience is it's easier to hire people in than to keep them on staff like that now most of you manage in the first first line now there may only be four people or six people or maybe 35 people because you most entrepreneurs choke their businesses to death and most entrepreneurs have too much control you can't buy pencils or rubber bands without them being involved I told the story last night or yesterday I think that I just saw my CEO of my manufacturing company for the first time in a year she used to be my administrative assistant and she's got her chance now she's running a business for me and you know and um, she also says it's a lot it's a lot different than carrying out orders that you give Dan than carrying out my own orders well that's because she's not the right hand of the chairman of the board anymore she's the head of the company herself and so and one thing titles do not earn you respect and I've told a lot of people this a lot of employees I make you president I make you general manager that doesn't mean anything doesn't mean spit you've got to earn your own stripes and people that are, are subordinate to you or, or lateral to you will be the first to tell you I mean just because the old man made you this I've been here 15 years you've been here 15 minutes you gotta earn your own respect in business and in life it's like the toughest kid on the block you know I mean you've got to earn that but most of you manage that way now whereas the in my judgment the right hand bottom right hand corner is the way to manage I can manage two or three people max this even at the top it's better than the top this one on the left hand side is management as you manage four or five projects four or five people I, I manage you know basically two people that's it I don't get involved I don't get involved with the micro end of the business in 1976 when I first attended the pace seminar with Jim Newman I went from mac micro thinking to macro thinking and from 1976 onwards is when I started making a lot of money I used to go in on the weekends and spend Saturday and Sunday planning for the rest of the week I'd plan 16 hours for the next 60 hour week and I was pretty successful by everybody's standards I was super successful I was one of the highest paid brokers uh, in the country when I was with Payne Weber but I didn't start to really have quantum success until I went from a micro non detail oriented that's why it's tough for the computer nerds engineers accountants lawyers to a macro sense I'm a global thinker when John Kennedy said we will put a what do you call it on the moon in this decade he wasn't thinking any of the details 
I don't know if he could spell physics. It's extremely important. And I'm going to get I ask Brule after the next break to come up and, and, and spend a couple minutes talking. But when she went from a micro to a macro thinker, and less control is really more control. The less control over you have over your people, the more control you have over your own life. And especially at this juncture, you know, if I can't, you know, play golf when I come to speak for somebody else, I don't go. I mean, it's not going to change my lifestyle. Now, in the life cycle of a business, everyone here that has a business is at one stage or another in this life cycle. Now, by definition, as I've already said, from the beginning, when you start with zero, you're growing geometrically, quantumly, because you're going from ground zero. But what happens is you start to get smart, and it starts to flatten out, and you become a manager. And you become a manager when you have your first employee, other than yourself. Then you have your second, third, fourth, etc., etc. Now, you, at the managerial level, you either become stay a manager, which is the flat line. You become a leader or, or professional manager, which is the line that's increasing. Or you stay an entrepreneur, which is the line rolling over. Every business in this room, every business that you know of, is in one of those three phases. Now it's interesting to note after 20 or 30 years of professional management and going to the, the proper B schools, now I, the IBMs of the world, etc., want to go back to that entrepreneurial spirit. They're trying to break up their companies, all these big companies, into entrepreneurial units that fend for themselves. It's taken 30, 40 years to figure out that that other system, other than building fiefdoms and building a lot of bureaucracy, don't necessarily build any empires. I personally am, I don't consider myself a professional manager because I'm not. I'm a leader of people. I used to say leader of men, but now I say people. <laughs> it's much easier to lead women, by the way. I mean, because women, their ego doesn't get involved. It's infinitely easier. I mean, the protégés that I have that are women are all assassins. I mean, leave no prisoners. They don't, they don't, they don't ask a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of questions of what if. Is this the way to do it? Is this the way to shortcut it? Etc. Etc. Because quantum leaps require you take the offensive. You can't achieve exponential gains in your success from a defensive posture. You can't remain a passive stance and make a quantum jump. You cannot make a, you cannot. You have to do it on the offensive. You have to be proactive, not reactive. Most of us in business are reactive, not proactive. I'm a lot of things. I've been called just about every name in the book, but no, never have I been called reactive. I always sue first. I'm always the plaintiff. Plaintiff gets to talk to the jury twice, or as they say in Texas, twice. People with PhDs. I've told you once. I've told you twice. We're not going to do it again. <laughs> PhDs. <laughs> plaintiff gets to talk to the jury twice. Boy, as soon as I figured that out, I was always the plaintiff. Revenue generation versus cost control, no contest. The name of game is always revenue. You can never experience hyper growth and quantum leaps in business without generating more revenue. You've got to keep focused on revenue. I never saw anybody that came in to cost cut at a company start a company. I've seen them close down a few <laughs> in my time. All managerial performance sins shall be always forgiven during periods of rapidly increasing revenue streams. You have banks wanting to do business with you. I mean, look, how do these companies that lose 10, 20, 100, 500 million dollars a year that are generating 12, 15 billion dollars of revenue always keep getting money? Did you ever think about it? Because they know, the financial institutions know 
that there is some source of repayment. They'll just add more de deficit and they'll lose more money. Companies that are losing $500 million a year can borrow all the money they want. The big difference between playing, there is a big difference between playing not to lose and playing to win. This is extremely important. Most people play not to lose. If you've got a 50,000 or 5 million or 25 million dollar company, you covet it. You, you, you sit on it like a hen or on her eggs because you're afraid of losing what you've attained. Because you've lost that passion that you had when you started the company. You lost that lust for life that you had. Because you've become satiated. If you do not expect it, you will not find the unexpected, for it is hard to find and difficult. If you don't expect high things, high performance things from yourself, if you don't have high expectations, you sure as hell won't get them. My son's expectation was to bat a thousand. Get on base every time, he batted 640. Then he became, he got real. I mean, hey, Derek, you don't have to do that. You're making it look bad for everybody, I mean. 278. He'll probably quit baseball next year. If I could somehow isolate my kids with just high performance people and get rid of all the little doofuses, I would. It'd be lonely, you're right. I mean... No playmates. Yeah. Failure is a resource that helps you find the edge of your capacities. The, the old saying in, uh, um, push it to the edge of the envelope, or what? Am I saying that right? Yeah. Um, when I went to San Diego in 1971, 1971, I came down here while I was going to graduate school, I commuted, as I said, on PSA for eleven, twelve dollars down here because I still was going to graduate school uh, in Los Angeles, and I, I ran a big sales division down here. I led the nation, had a ninety-four plus close ratio. I came in, and I had two hundred and forty or two hundred and sixty salespeople, and I st stood up on a Friday afternoon, called a sales meeting, and I stood up on the bench like this, a table, and I said, "You're all fired," because I had found out that they were skimming money, and and so I fired everybody, and I kept one girl as my assistant and I went to the Top Gun, the naval air base where they were discharging uh, Top Gun pilots. I hired 16 of them. They were all one looking for a job. And I taught them how to sell, got them real estate licenses and for 65 days we didn't make a sale. I made enough sales to carry the whole division by myself. On the 65th day, Bill Clarahan, I'll never forget his name if I live to be a thousand, made his first sale. He had, you know, the aha experience, and then, and Clarahan was probably the, the weakest of the 16 guys I had, and all of a sudden the other 15 started selling. We made more money. That's when I bought my first Rolls Royce. I mean, we were young guys, and we just, nobody told them. I mean, because these pilots, the, the pilots, the Top Gun pilots, don't know that three or four Gs ought to crush your skull. They don't know that. You can't tell a Top Gun pilot 5G's is going to cave in his chest. You cannot. It is impossible. They don't believe you. You know why? Because they do it all the time. They, you cannot tell a, 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 a pilot of that caliber that you can fly a plane till its wings fall off. You can't. It's true. Because they take them past the stress line all the time. So this is who I had for my sales force. We were like Grant taken Richmond, young, single, San Diego, flight attendants, money, rock and roll. <laughs> Life couldn't get much better. And I just, you know, they just uh, sell everybody. Dan says we're supposed to sell everybody. I guess we're supposed to sell everybody. And by God, we sold a lot of people. A lot of people in San Diego County own a lot of stuff that we put out. Every failure brings with it, a, um, in, with it the seed of an equivalent advantage. And Napoleon Hill said this about 60 years ago. 
too few times when we're, when we, whenever something didn't go right for us or we missed an acquisition, I'd sit my team down and we'd talk about, not necessarily went right, wrong, but what we'd do different. And we try to take advantage of those few failures that we did have. And, and I do it today. Um, and I sit down and what did we do wrong? How could we have made this better? And even though you, you, read a, you hear about that a lot, very few people do it. More importantly, even if they do it, then they don't follow up. Because they make the same mistakes. Remember those avoidable mistakes I talked about earlier? They make the same avoidable mistakes again. Progress often masquerades as trouble. Well, then there ought to be a lot of progress in this room because I've heard a lot of horror stories so far. And I mean that. I th I've said many times, I don't like people telling me the company's running smoothly. Couldn't be better. You might as well go run out and fall in front of a bus then. <laughs> I don't want to hear that. That's because, that means you're leaving a lot on the table. When I talked to Leanne, Leanne uh, Zakelli, who uh, runs the, the manufacturing operation for me, she says, boy, have we got problems this week. Good. And I never ask her why or what they are. Not interested. If I have to deal with those problems, then I don't need her, do I? Haven't got any calls here. When I gave the Castle Seminar, I think the people that were there will attest to this, Valerie, my administrative assistant in Scotland, didn't come with me, come to me with one thing. And I know we had things just falling out of bed left and right. I don't want to hear that because if I've got to deal with it, then I, I don't have the right person there. I am only brought in currently, and in my last 10 years anyway, 10 or 12 years, the big problems. When the big acquisition that we alluded to, which was Bow Valley USA, we bought it from a Canadian company, Bow Valley, out of Calgary, it fell out of bed and the transaction disintegrated. I came out of retirement to resurrect it and blow life back into it. And that's what I'm good at. Crisis management, some people call it. I don't call it that. But if you have to do day-to-day -day things, I was driving around the other day in Houston with one of the most successful businessmen in Houston and he made, um, I think, 70 phone calls in a day. Something's wrong with that deal. If I ever had to make 70 phone calls in a day, we have a lot of massive change in my administration. If I ever got 70 phone calls in a day, we'd have a massive change in my administration. Three to ten phone calls, normally three to six is what I get a day. I better not have to talk to more than three to six people. And half of those are normally people that attend seminars. Because even though I say I answer calls, hardly anybody calls. Uh, one, because they don't want to waste my time. And two, because they feel that, and rightfully so, they should have something fairly important to talk to me about when they call me. I don't want to talk about, you know, that your t letter, test letter didn't work. I mean, I don't care. You know, I really don't. Call one of the marketing uh, copyright gurus. I mean, the because um, that, that's not my forte. And one of the things that's also important, and that I, one of my pet gripes about a lot of these uh, seminars, is they give you advice. Not only do they give you advice that they have no expertise in, they've never thought about, but because they're there, they just feel they've got to flap their mouth. I mean... The, um, again, the things that we talk about here, I've personally done. As long as your troughs, be nice if I had that thing to draw on right now. As long as your troughs and peaks are higher than the ones before, your quantum lead program is working. God damn it. Debbie's making a note of that, I'm sure. Yeah, okay. Now just pretend you could see here. You know, I'd draw on the wall if I had a marker. <laughs> yeah, no, just, just pretend, just, okay. Now, now I'm going to have to really, I'm going to have to get better explaining this so you can visualize it. Okay, we have a piece of paper here and it's got an axis, a horizontal and vertical. And I've got troughs like this, peaks and valleys. Most of you focus on the peaks and when you go from a peak to a valley, the distance between the peak and the valley. As opposed to focusing on from where you started 
the distance between where you start and the bottom of the trough. As long as the bottom of the troughs continue to be higher, I don't measure from the peaks, I measure from the troughs. Because peaks don't last. Glory is fleeting, ladies and gentlemen. Peaks don't last. And if your downside is your trough, which is the low point in your cycle, and those bottom points are continued to be higher, then you're growing geometrically. Remember I said $2 million company, $50 million company, $425 million company. So this time around, you know, geometrically you ought to be a billion or two billion or five billion or something. It's an important concept. Don't focus on where you've been and how you've fallen because that's easy to do and we've all fallen into that trap. Focus on where you started from. Bless you. If you're experiencing no anxiety or discomfort, the risk you're taking probably isn't worthy of you. The only risks that aren't a little scary, the only risks that aren't a little scary are the ones you've outgrown. A high comfort level provides solid evidence that you're playing it safe, not growing. Not really testing your limits at all and not in the process of a quantum leap. If you don't have high anxiety, I mean, something's wrong. I recently hired a consultant to help me in my textile business. I know nothing about textile. I can barely spell it. And uh, he was born in a jute mill. Jute is the old form of the textile business. And he's a neighbor of mine in Scotland. He's a very nice man. But he doesn't want any high anxiety. And I have a reputation of being very litigious. And uh, the, uh, I feel the, co uh, the courts are a cleansing process. It separates the men from the boys. And, it, and I believe in the court system, you get a fair, you get a fair hearing. And um, he asked, he said, Dan, I, I want to work with you on this, but I, I have no anxiety in my life right now. And I'm afraid that if I partner up with you, I'll have a lot of it. <laughs> and I said, you're right, Michael, you will. So he sa had me sign a letter that I can't sue him, no matter even if he does something doofus. And, <laughs> and, which I did, I gladly, I gladly signed it. It's all right. He hasn't done, but now he's even trying harder not to do anything doofus. And, uh, but uh, he's 65, he's been retired uh, seven or eight years. And, um, but that's not where I am. I mean, because if I have no anxiety, then I know that I'm not growing or my people aren't growing or uh, if we're not making mistakes. And, and, and I've said this many times in the Watson book, uh, old man Watson that founded IBM, uh, was asked by a management trainee in the 20s or 30s, early 30s, I think it was the 20s, how do I get to the top of the management uh, ladder of this corporation? And the story goes, and it's true, Mr. Watson put his arm on the man's shoulder and said, double your failure rate, young man, double your failure rate. Double your failure rate. Swing at the plate. Swing more at the plate. Double your failure rate. Now, I've never had a problem with that. Because under no circumstance, another penism, do I ever second guess myself or my employees. I expect my employees to make mistakes. If they're not making mistakes, they're not growing. To grow by definition, you have to make mistakes. You cannot grow. It's impossible to grow without making mistakes. And then when they make them, you can't beat them up for it. Otherwise, they'll never make them again. You have to allow them to make the mistakes. And I sure as hell never second guess myself. Nobody's ever asked me if I made any money on Bow Valley USA. I've never thought about was it right to close down the Denver operation, which was their U.S. headquarters, and move them to Houston? I don't know. I never looked at the economics. I never figured it out. You know, I, I don't know. Don't care. Shareholders didn't care. Nobody in a shareholder meeting. When we used to have shareholders meetings, this is the truth. The most we ever had at a shareholder meeting when I was chairman and CEO, 10, 12 people. Some meetings we didn't have any. Shareholders knew them. One, I didn't, probably didn't care what they had to say. 
because I'm, I mean, you read any of our annual reports, it's pretty clear I wasn't too, too interested. When they owned as much stock as I did, and I'd listen to them, that kind of shut everybody up normally. They also felt comfortable because it was my money. Right now, you know, corporate CEOs in America today own in less than two tenths of a percent of their companies on average, Fortune 1000. Less than two tenths. That's one of the problems, in my judgment, that we have with corporate America. They don't own any of the, the assets. You own the assets and you start running it like it's your business, you make a lot of different decisions. It has been said that if, you're, if you will do the thing you fear, death of fear is certain. Courage is not the absence of fear and anxiety. It is proceeding in spite of those feelings. Now, I've said this a million times. High performance individuals like myself get paid a lot of money because we do things that make you nauseous. That you can't do or that you have trouble doing. I do things that make you uncomfortable. I may do things that give you colitis. I give, do things that give you ulcers, give you indigestion. I give ulcers and indigestion. I sure as hell don't get it. High performance people do things that are, make you feel uneasy, give you anxiety. That's a, I don't know if it's the preeminent difference, but it's a big, big difference. And that's why salespeople get paid a lot of money because they make cold calls. I don't think about it making me uncomfortable because it doesn't anymore. Used to. I got an F in public speaking. I mean, I got fired from my first two or three jobs. But that's a long time ago. I've developed a new aura quite strong presence some people say stronger than most anyway but it's basically I've done things that make other people uncomfortable one of which is you know one year I was gone from my family 242 days the uh, which the only reason my daughter knows is because she hears my wife I mean otherwise Kelly Kelly and my daughter she comes and sits on my lap and says, what do you want she has money. I said, you can't have it. She gets up. <laughs> I mean, it's quite simple. I mean, she, she calls a spade a shovel. She doesn't screw around. <laughs> no matter how easy it might be, never accept a short-term solution for a long-term problem. Two examples, 1982 and 1983. 1982, I had cash flow problems. I was running out of money. And... Uh, I found a guy that wanted to buy 50% of the company for two hundred and fifty dollars or $150,000, I don't remember exactly. I came that close to doing it. And what made me think about it and change my mind is that Bob Guccione, who I know because I did the first Penthouse Pet of the Year awards and lost a bunch of money with him, he told the story of in the 60s, he was trying to sell the idea of Penthouse. Playboy was just raging in the 60s. Hugh was running around sleeping with everybody in town. Everybody in the country, maybe. And he, he couldn't, he, he had expended all his money, he had borrowed from all his friends, and he's sleeping on a park bench in Hyde Park, this is Guccione, with newspaper over him. That's where he was sleeping. He'd run out of money. And he found a guy that was willing to buy 50% of the penthouse, pe penthouse magazine idea for a thousand pounds. A thousand pounds in those days was about three or four thousand dollars. A pound was three to four to one. He sold it to him. He went to a hotel, got cleaned up bought a suit, and then he had, you know, seller's remorse. He thought about it and said, what a doofus thing this has been. So he went back and borrowed money from the other people. He hadn't borrowed money yet, and he paid the guy back the, the thousand, and he kept. Penthouse, and three, three weeks later, he found funding. I said yesterday, and I've said always, there is some moron in the world that will fund your project. Someplace, somewhere. He may not be on this continent, he may be in Australia, he may be in South America, he may be in New Guinea. There is a doofus born that will fund your deal. And you just haven't looked hard enough. Bob Gucci only finally found his. Thank you. Oh, 
I can thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, I came that close. And then again in 1983, I bailed myself out of that cash flow problem. In 1983, now I'm running out of cash again. So, a guy from Dallas, Texas wanted to buy into the company. And again, I came that close. And this time, I decided not to do it because my two partners, Charlie and Mark, didn't want to be diluted. And even though I had 80, they had 20, I said, okay, if you, if you were willing to ride it out, we'll ride it out. And we did. And, you know, the rest is history. Um, that guy ultimately sued me for not selling him part of the company. And we fought a big deal all the way to the Supreme Court of Texas, which I want. He said we had a contract. I said we didn't. Now, short, that's short-term solutions to, to, to long-term problems. Virtually every business that I look at is in the process of making short-term solutions to long-term problems. I have never been involved with a business my entire business career that small to medium-sized business that doesn't make short-term solutions to long-term problems because it's the easiest way out. And remember how I said earlier, uh, Napoleon Hill said that's why uh, rivers and people are crooked because they go to the way of least resistance. It is. It's easier. Ladies and gentlemen, life's too short not to follow what you believe in. And there's a lot of people in this room that, given this data, given this information, will probably go home and rethink where they are, what they're doing, what they've been doing the last few years. That's good. It's also good that you have an opportunity to at least once in your business career be confronted with some of these ideas because it's not likely that you'll be exposed to them any other way um, it's and it's it, even CEOs of fairly large organizations have labored under this false misconception that many of you have in this room actually you know that cost cutting is better than revenue generating that more control, not I mean, that's because basically conventional wisdom is always wrong. Not always, almost always wrong. What you want to find, when you're looking for a mentor, you want to have, find somebody that has a dream and that has fulfilled part of that dream or all that dream. You want to go into business with people that have dreams. You want to have business relationships with people that have high expectations. You want to have business relationships with people or just hang around people. Somebody said here, uh, Tom Peters told them to go buy lunch for successful people. I forget who told me that. Somebody did. Um, and, uh, and hang around with them. And you'll be surprised how these dreamers will take the time. Because first of all, very few people call. Very few people call. I had a kid, that, a young man in his 30s that attended a seminar in Chicago that called W. Clement Stone up and got a dinner appointment with him. Now he's old now, you know, and he said, we, we're going to have to eat here because I can't make it out to a restaurant. But he saw him. I was pretty impressed. I liked that. You know, I would have never thought of calling W. Clement Stone. Now I want to spend a few moments and explain to you Quickly, why you probably, not probably why, you have difficulty in generating funds for your businesses. I said, that I went over this yesterday, and we're going to go over it again because it's important. We're going to assume that we have five investment opportunities. And we're going to assume for this example that they all have at least 30% minim, 30 minimum rate of return cash on cash. And we're going to assume that the risk factor is based on your experience, my experience, and the experience, I mean competition, how many deals you've done, litigation, etc. Now, if you look down the, the uh, middle column, potential of rate of return, 9 is the highest, and this is on a scale from 1 to 10, 10 being highest. That means the highest rate of return. So a 9 would probably have a rate of return of somewhere around 100% cash on cash. And a, uh, on the risk side, Potential of risk of 10 would be something on the order of magnitude probably has an 80 or 90 percent potential of you losing all your money. Okay. So investment number one is your idea. 
you come to somebody like me and, and, and I do the rating when, I, when people come. I, you don't do the rating. I do the rating. Because when I, you rate them, I mean they're all uh, one uh, or ten rates of return and, and one potential risk. And you come to me with a project that's got a potential rate of return of nine, which is, like I said, maybe a hundred rate of return cash on cash in a year. A year. This is a year. This isn't in the lifetime of the project. This is a year. And it's got a potential risk of, of 10. That means maybe it's only got a 10 or 20% chance of making it. The next investment has got a four rate of return. Probably means that it's a 40 or 45% rate of return cash on cash per year. And it's got an eight potential risk. So maybe it's got a, a 60 or 65% chance of, uh, of making it or 30 or 40% chance of losing all your money. Investment three, rate of returns five, means that the rate of return uh, is probably in the order of magnitude of um, 50 or 60, and the potential risk is two. Now, which means that you've only got a 10 or 20 percent chance of losing all your money. Uh, to, to cut to the chase, that is the kind of investment, not necessarily me, that a bank a financial institution is going to be interested in lending against. Or a potential joint venture partner is going to be interested in putting up money. All things being equal and not talking about risk weighting a portfolio. Me personally, I'm interested in something that's going to have one to a thousand, 100 to 1,000 percent and it's got maybe a 40 percent chance of losing all my money. I'm not interested if your deal makes 16 percent cash on cash keep it in your purse or in your briefcase don't come see someone like me I also would submit to you that if the difference between two over prime and four over prime kills your deal your deal is not worth doing I've never seen interest debt service Unless we're talking about like a KKR Nabisco where they took on four times more debt than they should have. See, that deal's dying not because the interest rates have gone up three points. That deal's dying because they paid six times more than it was worth. And why did they pay six times more than it's worth? In this man's opinion, because of the $1.700 million in fees that were paid. Do you remember when they, the bid went from six billion to nine billion to twelve billion to fifteen billion to whatever the hell it was ultimately got to for Nabisco? Did anybody ever think? I wonder why. I mean, how come the company got worth so much more money? It was never worth more money. They just wanted to get the deal done. I think the fees went from six hundred million to a billion seven. That was a good incentive. Most of the deals, I mean, when you structure, see, and that, it all goes back to investigate before you invest. Most of you look at the wrong kind of transactions. Most of you look at the wrong kinds of businesses. If these aren't the kind of numbers that you're coming up with, then in my judgment, you're looking at the wrong kinds of things. And quite frankly, some of you are probably looking at the wrong kinds of industries. Well, the two things that I know they're hot, that I'm, uh, one is healthcare, one is telecommunications. If you can't make money in healthcare and telecommunications, you'll let a bus run over you. <laughs> I'm in neither one. Because Rick Scott, my old friend, has got healthcare in his pocket. And, and you know, I'm not going to change things I can't change. He's already there $15 billion strong, and he's as smart as me, probably smarter. So, I mean, that. I mean, that, that precludes me, or in, my, the intelligent decision I've made is not stay out of health care. And telecommunications, I have been working on various things in telecommunications. But now, and see, where you make money is where there's chaos. That's where the big money's made. Chaos. When energy went from 40 to $6 a barrel oil, there was chaos, pandemonium. And healthcare right now with Mrs. Clinton sticking her nose in it, there's pandemonium. 
telecommunications where the uh, what do you call that network the highway superhighway the, yeah there's pandemonium a lot of big money is going to be made in that industry you go where there's pandemonium thinking of Rick Scott who by the way is the is the president and CEO of uh, Columbia Healthcare who just made a four billion dollar merger yesterday when he was my lawyer as I mentioned in 1986 1987 he sat at my right side doing deals and he went out on his own and he um, took his life savings bought a little health care deal and he's leveraged it up to now he's the largest health care uh, manager owner in, in the nation and it's interesting he lets all his regional managers as I've already said I think make million dollar decisions without having to come back to the home office and he's got out 200 of them they can make million dollar decisions less control more entrepreneurial flavor so these are the kinds of numbers that you should be looking at in my judgment not you know nine percent cash on cash now We're going to go through the actual quantum leap plan. Um, now, I was asked to put this to paper because I do this intuitively. I mean, I, but I, I, I finally sat down and, and uh, this is 11 steps from idea to execution. If you're no it's not in that notebook no if you cannot if your thing doesn't stand up to muster to this then you know how you they make disclosures on uh, cigarettes you could be hazardous to your health if your deal doesn't stand up to this ladies and gentlemen the deal could be hazardous to your health okay number one you identify an idea whatever it be, is an acquisition a new product whatever the heck it is doesn't matter Number two, you investigate. You go out and you find out about the individual, about the, the, the company, if it's a public company, the public records, that book back there tells you how to investigate before you invest. You go through a lot of due diligence, it's called, on Wall Street. Then you investigate some more. You find out criminal records, property records, tax records. Has the individuals ever been, you know, I, I remember talking to a uh, former Olympic coach, wrestling coach, and we walked through this deal, and then I finally asked him, by the way, I normally ask this first, but I was so enamored because he was an Olympic coach. Has anybody been in jail on this deal? And he says, yeah, all the principals. <laughs> I said, holy smoke. So needless to say, I didn't do that deal. You continue to investigate. In fact, your investigation process doesn't end until the deal is consummated. Okay, now you're, you, you've made the commitment. You, you get obsessed, which is easy for me. You get obsessed. You walk it, you talk it, you live it, you breathe it. This is now your baby. Now, you and your other decision makers, to the extent that you have any, you make the pri preliminary decision, you get them involved, you share your obsession and you live it totally. And they live it totally. If you ever hear one of your managers, one of your partners, one of your colleagues badmouth the deal, you crush them like a grape right then. You continue to investigate. Use private investigators if necessary. $5,000 on a private investigator has saved me countless millions, tens of millions. Okay, now you have a decision action plan. You and again, the other decision makers, you want to bring them in so they have responsibility for it too. So it's not, if it fails, it's not just your idea. You want them to have a reason to make it come to fruition because it's everybody's idea. You further expand the obsession. You tell them how they're going to own part of it. That'll expand the obsession real quick. How they're going to own equity in it. And you walk your talk and now this is 
extremely important. You never, ever, ever, ever share any doubts you have about the project with any living soul, including your spouse or significant other. Never! And I'm just going to give you one example of what I mean. We're working on an acquisition a few years ago. And um, the, the, my, my partner and vice chairman of the company came to me and he said, how do you think it's working out, Dan? And I said, no, I'm, I think it's a little weak. I think our legal representation in the, in the UK is a little weak. That's all I said. A few days later, one of the daughters of one of our middle management employees was at a ladies' health spa, sitting in the steam room. Now, I don't know, men don't wear anything in the steam room. I don't know if women wear with them in the steam room. But they're all sitting around the steam room, these women. And this daughter of one of the middle managers, managers hears the vice chairman's wife talking to the CFO's wife about how Dan, the old man, as I was called, thinks there's trouble with the so-and-so deal. That little girl, that 23-year-old little girl, left that steam bath and went home and told her daddy. By the time I got back from Australia, the company was in chaos, not the good kind of chaos, the bad kind, and the deal was falling in the toilet rapid fire. It took me a month to trace back and find out. Because I interviewed the people, who told you? Who told you? Who told you? And I, I finally got back to the vice chairman's wife. That is the last time I ever shared a doubt in any transaction I have ever been involved in. Remember that loose lips sink ships? Well, loose lips sinks deals. If the deal is collapsing and I may look like Nero fiddling as Rome burns, everything's fine. Everything's Jake, as they used to say. Couldn't be better. Don't tell my wife. Ask me no questions and I tell you no lies. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell my lawyers. Don't tell my accountants. Don't tell my advisors. When they were landing the first man on the moon, October 20-something, 1969, do you realize that if he had said that we would land a man on the moon by 19, you know, uh, uh, in the middle of the decade, they probably would have landed in the middle. He said by the end of the decade. It's funny how it was October 1969, don't you think? <laughs> but as the guys were coming down, they were running out of fuel, and there was a last-minute decision. The astronaut, whoever was responsible, made the decision to land anyway because the deal was collapsing. I forget if it was, uh, it was a uh, computer malfunction or engine malfunction. I forget what happened. But something happened and they weren't sure he could land. And then they weren't sure he could take off again. They didn't have enough gas. Okay, enough gas, enough petrol. Now that came back to the, 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 the United States public after the fact. It's all, right, all right, it's all right to share your doubts in books after the fact. But not during. Okay, so you never share your doubt. Now, number eight, you put together the other decision makers, not you. This is where you shove off the responsibility. The other decision makers put together a critical path, a timeline. Them, not you. Because you want them to be responsible for it. Now, this is a detailed observation of a timeline and it's continually measured. It's not like the business plan that you paid for and you put in your bottom drawer and you never look at it again. It's the, the flight plan that hopefully, unless you were flying US Air, that the guy pulls out and checks every four or five minutes. Plans are continually monitored. Number nine, implementation. Im, excuse me, implementation. Again, the other decision makers, not you. They have focused follow-up at other levels. So their subordinates, to the extent that you have them, focused follow-up, continual follow-up, focused follow-up at the decision-maker level. That's the people that you've implemented 
to make the decision, help you make the decision. Number 10, execution. You're steadfastly laser beam focused. You live it. There's nothing else you're thinking about. And you lead from the front. And you never second guess yourself or others. I use this, this story, uh, General Eisenhower during D-Day. And it's, it's funny because the guys from the 8th Army are here yeah. for the reunion. So uh, they already know this. But, um, you know, D-Day wasn't supposed to work. You couldn't land people on Normandy. Nobody was more surprised at D-Day than uh, President Eisenhower, than General Eisenhower. But they had to do something to stop the momentum. And it worked. You know, D-Day worked. But when they were making the decision on general officers, we're not going to land initially on the beaches. Um, and uh, General Eisenhower took a piece of string and um, he, he pushed the middle of the string and the string's parts fell to the side. And then he pulled the string and the string followed very neatly. He says, we've got a lead from the front. We need general officers on the beach. In fact, that's how I believe uh, the famous general, I'm trying to think of it, it was Teddy Roosevelt's son died at Omaha or uh, Normandy. One of, the general, one of the presidents early in the century, son died on uh, D-Day. I don't remember which one. You lead from the front. So, in the execution, when it goes wrong, you don't second guess your people because you've given them the responsibility and the authority and you don't second guess your, yourself. You just come up with creative ways to alternate the plan, change the plan, modify it continually. And you lead from the front and you're always there as a cheerleader. I considered myself the Vince Lombardi of management in the energy business in the 80s and early 90s. I was down there, you know, I was, a, I was the highest price, price cheerleader in the country. You know, I was lean to the left, lean to the right, stand up, sit down, fight, fight, fight. That was me. And then, you, number 11 is you re-evaluate a monitoring process and you start all over again. Not the, at the identif identification stage, but when you, you continue to investigate, you continue to monitor, you continue to, to, to make sure the implementation is followed up on, and now this is the four step action plan and you work backwards what's your wanted outcome Where do you want to be? What do you want to have accomplished? Desired completion. You make the commitment. It's your pay price to action. What are you, wor well, what are you willing to give up? What are you willing to do? How much are you willing to sacrifice? Remember we talked about 15 pounds, no more Stoli Chania. By the way, last night I'm having a drink at the bar and I ordered Stoli. And the guy at the end of the bar bought me a drink and he said, um, um, I'm the Stoli's distributor here in town. Let me buy one on you, for you. I thought it was cute. You measure, measure and continue to measure periodically. And very importantly, you continue to modify. You change the plan as necessary and you continue to change it. Remember, a plane, a rocket ship, whatever, is failing its way 90% of the time to target. We get, the, uh, I think they're still copying it in. Yeah, okay. We, we, get, we get these ideas. See, all of a sudden we go through our career with no ideas and then we get an idea and we sit on it and like we're in concrete. And even if it's not working, I'm, I, I can tell you about marketing my, my talents, 65,000 brochures went out at $3 and some cents a piece with no um, address or phone number in them, 
that's not the biggest marketing mistake I ever made, it's just one of them. And um, I kept on writing my own copy and putting ads in the papers that didn't work. I just loved it. In fact, we have a brochure, I don't think we have any copies here, that was written by a professional, a PhD type English lit. It was reviewed by psychiatrists, Catholic priests, uh, big time MBAs. There's not a dangling participle or a split infinitive in the deal. It, it did not sell one stinking seminar seat. Not one stinking seminar seat. I spent the better part of a half a million dollars on erroneous ideas that I thought were good because I like to hear of them. I like the sound of them, so what the hell. It's a good thing I started with... You know how you, you, you make a, a big fort or a small fortune in Israel, you start with a small... No, you make a small fortune in Israel, you start with a big one. It's a good thing I started with a big fortune, otherwise I'd be out of this business by now. Because I didn't change, you know. And I still make these mistakes. I'll get involved in a deal that I won't change. Then somebody will remind me of this overhead. Dan, they'll fax it to me anonymously. It'll just come, it'll come across my fax machine and there'll be no numbers on it. Hmm, what are they trying to say? And then I get the private investigators to check everybody's phone bills, see? And then I find out who sent it to me. Because everybody that works for me has their phone flagged. <laughs> okay. Penism, plan for success, no backup plans, no rip cords, no fail safes, or you will fail. As I told you earlier, you come with me with a plan A and plan B, forget it. Nice knowing you, have a good life. I only want to see plan A, and I assure you, any financial institution, any other high performance person that you might ever involve or potentially involve in one of, the, one of your um, deals doesn't want to hear about if, if things don't go right. And doesn't want to hear about making 11% cash on cash. The more you investigate, the less you'll have to invest. I've already talked about that. Now, the important thing there at the bottom, the people problem. Getting people, selling your dream, and letting go of part of it. Don't get trapped by pride of authorship. Now, I've talked about pride of authorship, but it's important. You get paid in life for not what you do, but what you get other people to do. You get paid in life. The CEO of IBM or American Telephone and Telegraph gets four or ten or twenty million dollars a year, whatever he gets, not for what he does, what he gets his people to do. Unless you're a rock star or a, um, you know, a uh, celebrity, uh, sports celebrity, you get paid for what you get people to do. So selling your dream is extremely important. Selling that obsession. Because more of the same usually just gives you more of the same. If, if you've got to involve your people to get to the level that we've talked about, you've got to involve everybody that's part of your organization, including your advisors, accounting, legal, etc. You've got to get them involved. Because you're going to be asking them to take part of the deal in lieu of fees, perhaps or a way to get paid. I used to use Coopers and Lybron and Melvinie and Myers like banks. I paid them once or twice a year whether I needed to or not. I paid them when we did a deal. It can still be done. And should be done. Because trying harder and harder starts producing less and less. Now at this juncture I want Burl to come up and talk about trying harder and harder and less control is more control and how you choked your business and now how it's bloomed just for a couple of minutes. Um, she's one of my superstars and um, it's a lot easier to help train women, I'm telling you. The, uh, although I got some great superstars that are men, but um, the, um, now Burl has taken, I, I, I'm not putting words in her mouth, but literally I think, she has not tried to reinvent anything. If it says Lotus one two three, she does it Lotus one two three, and I mean, and if for those of you that can stomach it, you will have the greatest success if you follow the stuff verbatim. I will guarantee you success if you follow it verbatim. There is no chance. 
that you will make, as Napoleon Hill used to say, it will come to you with such abundance you will be overwhelmed if you follow verbatim every stinking step no wishy-washy or as my grandmother used to say no witchy-washy Burl can we have a mic for Burl? Just talk about a little bit uh, about some of the other, you've heard a lot of other people, you've talked to, you've gone to all the seminars, yeah. you've heard all the crap, I mean. Um, I have been to absolutely everybody. I mean, there isn't a seminar speaker out there that I have not been to. I mean, uh, most of Ed's clients, I know them personally, I've been lunch with them. I mean, you know, in, in fact, most of the time I was an investor bringing them into the city. You know, it was just... We have girl day, girl <laughs> And uh, um, because I was always searching for something, and my background was a registered nurse, I, like I, and I went to real estate and made a lot of money and did really well. Opened my own real estate company, and and one of the big guys bought me out because I was really putting a squeeze on them. And I didn't really have any business background at all, none at all. I didn't know what to do, and um, I was looking for something. I was looking for somebody 
that, that I could, that had, was where I wanted to be and could help me, all right? And it would help me. And there are very few people out there, and all the seminar speakers say, oh yes, they'll all help you. But when, when you call them, I've never, in fact, one guy called 11 times and he never even called me back. So, I mean, it, it just doesn't happen. And the first, no, I don't phone Dan very often, very rare, because I, I know he's very busy and I don't want to use up his valuable time. But I know that I could be in the middle of a negotiation, and if I needed them, I, I could walk out of there, telephone, and I know. And, and that, that's a comfort level for me. Okay, and whether I ever have to use it or not, I don't know. But it is a comfort level that's there, and that's really important. Um, I learned more in two hours with Dan than I did with Tony Robbins, uh, Brian Tracy, the whole deal. I mean, there isn't anybody I haven't seen. And uh, um, he's certainly, he's taken my net worth from $5 million to $20 million. And, and uh, that's kind of, I mean, it's not where since, I want to be. Since when? Oh, since last May. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I want a house so big when you walk into it, there's a sign that says, you are here. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I can't say enough. His stuff works. It's easy. It, it is very, very easy. And you just follow the book. That's all you got to do. Just follow the book. And, and uh, it works. I mean, it works incredibly well. As I said, I have no business experience. I'm not a Harvard graduate, that's for sure. And uh, it's, certainly, it's, working, it's certainly working very well for me. Oh, the manual. The manual. The manual, yeah. You need to go home and, and, and read it a couple times and, and really absorb it and, and uh, uh, you'll get more out of it. Now, the other thing is, um, I've seen him seven times and all over the world and I'm going to fall around with a little puppy dog and so does Casey and so does Bruce and, and we're all making a lot of money and that's what you have to do. You can't just hear a person once. I don't go to any seminars. I would go free to another seminar. I mean, they could put me up, I don't care where, and I wouldn't go. I mean, unless Dan was there. That's the only criteria for going to a seminar, is that Dan's cool. there. Thanks a lot, bro. I think it's important to note, you mentioned, mentioned Bruce Whipple, who's uh, another one of uh, the, the guys who just lives and breathes Penyisms. Uh, I came up with one idea for him, just one. It wasn't, I didn't think it was such a great idea until I found out what it did. He has a company called Out of Cost International where he goes into Fortune 1000 companies at that juncture and saves them money on taxes and utility bills and telephone bills, which isn't such a great concept. There's a lot of other people doing it in the country. And um, uh, he had leveled out, I, I don't know, three or four million dollars a year. And I told him, you know what you ought to do is throw away all your prospect cards. Now you tell a sales marketing guy that and it makes, I mean, it gives him colitis. <laughs> Throw away your prospect cards. He said, I, I, uh, he started twitching. He says, I don't think I can do that. I don't think my people can do that. I said, now he had, he had done a little bit of business with IBM. And I told him that you are now going to be big blue, little big blue, what they call IBM. And I said, you're going to go to around the Fortune 50 companies and that's all you're going to do. From... May of last year through December of last year, he added $35 million in revenue on the books. Then he landed Reader's Digest, then he landed AT&T, then he landed, I forget. But then he started to diversify, he just told me. He was diversifying a little and he lost quite a bit of money and, and he says, I'm coming back because everybody does it. I mean, even smart ones. Me, I did it. And he says, Dan, he says, why don't you whack me in the head? And he says, because you've learned from this, haven't you, Bruce? Have I? Why did I have to learn that way? Why did you just stop me? I said, no, you learned. He learned now. Well, he, he, he's back to just because he went out into another part of the audit cost business he didn't understand as well. And I said, just do more of the same. Build more refineries. I mean, <laughs> just do more of the same. And I think, I don't know if Ed gave you the example, you know, and on the lower end of the continuum, a karate guy who made 19000 his first year after me made 85000 or 89000 Yeah, I mean, and it works. I mean, a karate, I mean, a guy that gives karate lessons. And um, I think he enjoyed telling the rich parents, your kid's a doofus. He's going to have to have five lessons a week because he's a doofus. He's uncoordinated, fat little moron. 
You know, he enjoyed that. He enjoyed that. Or so, sometimes he had to tell people, your kid has no talent. I can't take your money. How many have taken lessons from tennis or that kind of stuff? I'm here to tell you most of you don't have the talent to, to be above D players in anything you do. That's life. Yet they keep taking your money. They keep taking your money. I ascertain when I, when I pay somebody, can I be an A-level or double-A player? The answer is yes, I continue. And, I, and then I, uh, I get second, third opinions too. If it's not, then I don't, you know, it's like kissing your sister. I mean, why do you want to do it? And the, uh, but I mean, these people, and we have them from people that have done it from, ten, you know, in the thousands of dollars to the millions of dollars and everywhere in between. This stuff works. It just, it's, it's not hard. Well, just wait until you start this stuff about doing, telling people what you really think and it eliminates a lot of crap in life. You're going to have a lot, you're going to have less people to talk to. I can assure you that. You're going to waste a lot of less, you're going to waste no time. I mean, you're going to get down to business. You're going to have the pedal to the metal. And I mean, it's, it's, it's just, um, I, I, it's, 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 it's something that's hard to explain. Burl does it well. She experienced it. And, and uh, to the extent that you need the replication. 90% of what I say here today, you will forget within 30 to 90 days. Unless it's replicated. There's only two ways of replicating it. Hear me again. I used to give free seminars. If you attend one, you can attend them all for a year, free. You know how few people, remember? You know how few people did it? Yeah, well, if you, I mean, now we don't do that anymore, you know, because, you know, it's, it, it's, it hear me a lot, interface with me, you know, listen to the tapes. I have, uh, I think, I don't know if I gave this example, but Bruce Whipple's son, whose highest game he had ever bowled was a 117. He's in a bowling league, a little kid bowling league. He listened to the tapes about my son and the 640 batting average, because it's in the tapes I have. And uh, his kid went and bowled 167. Bruce called me up. Maybe it's a coincidence. Maybe it was time. It was ready for him to break out, Dan. I said, yeah. 117 was the highest he ever bowled. What's his average? 78. I, I don't think it was time for him to break out, actually. <laughs> I think that we may have had something to do with it. That's great, you know. Um, the, um, but it, you have to have it replicated. Now, th it's my life. So, I mean, I live it, breathe it, sleep it. Everything I do. And for those of you that have been at my house, I talk just like this at my house in front of my kids, except I use four-letter words in front of my kids. And I try to clean it up, you know, to, for, to, for because we're down here in the sensitivity uh, center of the world. You know, there's special rays or some kind of meridians come together and cartify the sea. And that's where there's a lot of goofy people down here. And so I've tried to clean, and remember, I've never met a sensitive person that had any money. None. You know, I'm, I, I want to be proven wrong someday, but I haven't, heretofore I haven't anyway. But um, it's replication, replication, replication. You know, it's 17 times before it's absorbed. You have to listen to the tapes or hear me 17 times. And uh, the, um, but I mean, it, it works. There's just no question about that. And if the other high-performance people, you know, were out here teaching, they'd be teaching very similar. And we're not exactly the same because we're, we're different personalities. But it's a lot better than trying harder and harder and producing less and less. Yeah, let's take five.